together for another virtual vintage. Next week is our last vintage of the season. Um, we're going to take off July and probably uh, August, but we'll return as the students return to the University of Virginia. And we're thinking about ways that um, we might include you all who have come in from Vancouver Island and St. Paul and Atlanta and you know, across the world. Um, so hopefully there will be another virtual um, aspect to this where we can welcome you in. So um, next week, we are gonna have um, uh, Terry Lindvall come to talk about C.S. Lewis. And Terry is a, a Lewis expert. And we are gonna talk about Lewis's essay called Learning in, the t in Wartime. So looking forward to that um, grand finale together. Um, so today we're talking about Julian of Norwich, so let's, let's jump in. Um, I love this quote from Thomas Merton. Um, and before I, before I get into it, uh, if you haven't found the reading, you can find it online. It's at theologicalhorizons.org slash vintage. And the PDF is there for you to uh, find and, and download if you wish to read along with us um, or save for later or share with friends. So Merton says this, Julian was, is without a doubt one of the most wonderful of all Christian voices. She gets greater and greater in my eyes as I grow older. And whereas in the old days, I used to be crazy about St. John of the Cross, I would not exchange him now for Julian if you gave me the world and the Indies and all the Spanish mystics rolled up in one bundle. This is for her, Merton says, the heart of theology not solving the contradiction, but remaining in the midst of it, in peace, knowing that it is fully solved, but that the solution is secret in God and will never be guessed until it is revealed. And I love that we have um, a mix of people here, students and um, uh, more mature adults, shall we say. And I'm interested for you all um, who might be further along on the journey, if you might feel the same way that Merton does, that as you've grown um, in life, that, that, Mer that Julian maybe has become more dear or more significant to you. And if that's true, if you would unmute yourself or chat in the box and sort of share a little bit about um, how you have come to know Julian. Um, so the students might um, hear from you. Well, I love Julian <laughs> and um, I'm a Presbyterian preacher's kid. I went to Wheaton College, majored in philosophy. And I, honestly, I don't remember um, when I first read Julian, but um, yeah, I was fascinated by this, this phrase, all will be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. And I think that reassurance, although it sounds kind of like um, a bit of a cliche, something you'd see on a, on a mug maybe, um, it keeps coming back to me as something that I would like to hold uh, as, a, as, a, as a truth and as, a, as an assurance. And we're going to be reading that today. Uh, Jocelyn, yes, you are a rock star, she says. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the rock star Jocelyn you're thinking of, but I'm Jocelyn Kelly. I've been really enjoying your Friday stories. Okay. Oh, from your, your home in Charlottesville. Yay. And uh, Catherine's new. She looks forward to reading about Julian. So glad that you're all here. Um, whether you're familiar with her, whether she is meaningful to you or not, hopefully by the end of this hour, We'll have a lot to share. So our reading, um, before we begin the reading, a, a few words about, about Julian. She has become very popular in many circles. Um, her books, uh, Divine Showings or Revelations, have become really, really um, popular and, and widely read. But she was born in 1342 uh, and died in around 1416. So why would that be? Um, one writer says that her writings are, speak to a gospel of love, that they bear witness that we are created in love, redeemed by love, and enclosed within love. And because we have been loved in God's mind from without, 
beginning, as Julian puts it, so in this love our life is everlasting. So because Julian understands that love is the meaning of all of Christ's revelations, and we crave these assurances of love, we all do, um, that even in this time, especially during this time of fear, Julian brings a gospel of love to us. But we don't know a lot about her life. We have very few facts, and Julian scholars um, get into all kinds of arcane debates, as you can imagine. Uh, we don't even know her real name. She was called Julian of Norwich because she lived attached to the church uh, of St. Julian in Norwich, England. Um, she was born, as I said, during the 14th century, and she lived through all kinds of tumults, which is why I really love to read her in sort of our own chaotic times. Um, she lived during the Hundred Years' War between England and France. She was probably a merchant class wife and mother before she became enclosed as an anchorite. And an anchorite or anchoress was a person who was not a, completely a lay person, not a, a priest or a monk or a nun enclosed in a monastery or a convent, but a person dedicated to life kind of in this in-between space between the city and the church, between the sacred and the secular. So she occupied a really interesting position in society. Um, she survived five cycles of the plague, and this plague, as you know, killed eventually half the population of Europe. And certainly in Norwich, um, people suffered from the plague. She witnessed the brutalities of peasant revolt in Norwich. She saw um, heretics burned at the stake just a mile or two from her anchor anchorage. And significantly, in the year 1373, she became deathly ill. She describes her body like her soul kind of slipping away from her body. And in that moment, she experienced visions of Christ suffering on the cross. And in her vision, Christ spoke to her directly, audibly, you know, interiorly. And over the years, she would struggle and work to recount the content of these visions what she said, what Christ said, what she saw. And so we have two versions of her um, revelations of divine love. There's a short version and there's a long version. She um, recorded 16 of her, her showings in these texts. And it's especially interesting because she considered she was unlettered. That means she couldn't read or write in Latin. And again, she was not a trained uh, monastic. So she wrote in Middle English, which she called the language of the Evan Christian, the Ever Christians, the common Christians. And she did so even though it was strictly forbidden for an uneducated lay person, especially a woman, to write or teach theology in this vernacular. So she has a, an important place in history because she wrote the first book ever written by a woman in the English language, in our English language, the beginnings of English. So remember, she was an anchorite. Um, she lived in this enclosed cell attached to the church. Again, there's always debate about you know, exactly where it was, exactly how many windows it had. But I love to imagine it as a space with three windows. And one window looked into the church so she could participate in the worship, into her garden, and one window onto the street. And people would come up to her window from the street and tell them, tell her their troubles. So she knew everything that was going on in the world. She knew both the world of the spirit and the world of, of real life. Um, you often see her uh, pictured with a cat. She makes reference to the creature that I loved. And I love that. And, and apparently there's, there's some story that she had a, a maid named Alice. Uh, so that, that gets interesting for me. Uh, Mary Dryden says she's a fellow cat person. So I love, I love the cat thing. Anyway, many wonderful questions and legends and, and, and images of, of Julian. But today we're going to read her words. We're going to read words from her revelations of divine love. And we're going to listen to Sister Julian's voice to us and hear what she might have to say to us in this moment in our own lives. So let's begin um, with the reading. She opens her revelation by saying these words. These are shown to a simple, unlettered creature, the year of our Lord, 
1373, the 13th day of May. And she writes this revelation. In this revelation, God showed a little thing, the size of a hazelnut in the palm of my hand. And it was as round as a ball. It, I looked at it with the eye of my understanding and thought, what can this be? And it generally answered thus, it is all that is made. I marveled how it could continue because it seemed to me it could suddenly have sunk into nothingness because of its littleness. And I answered in my understanding, it continues and always shall because God loves it. And in this way, everything has its being by love of God. In this little thing, I saw three characteristics. The first is that God made it. The second is that God loves it. The third, that God keeps it. Let's pause and, and reflect on this vision for a moment. Um, and again, if you'd like to make a comment, drop it into the chat box, unmute yourself. I know it's, it's not an easy way to have a conversation, but um, we can do this together. What does this vision tell us about Julian's understanding of creation and about ourselves? What do you hear in this vision? I love the idea that regardless of of where we are and in our understanding of who we are as God's creation, sometimes we feel like the unworthiness or the I'm not good enough. I think just that beautiful reminder that no matter how small we think we are, that we're loved and we're treasured. Mm, thank you. Yeah, what could be more any what could be smaller or more humble than a little brown bumpy hazelnut? I like the hazelnut. What does this vision tell us about her idea of God? What does she tell us about God? His, his intimate connection with his creation. Mm, thank mm. you. Let's continue. She, she recounts this vision. Our good Lord showed to me a spiritual vision of God's simple loving. I saw that God is to us everything that is good and comfortable for us. God is our clothing, which for love enwraps us, holds us, and all encloses us because of his tender love, so that God may never leave us. And so in the showing, I saw that God is to us everything that is good as I understood it. For God does not despise what he has created, and he does not disdain to serve us, even at the simplest duty that is proper to our body in nature, because of the love of our soul which God has made in his own likeness. For as the body is clad in clothes, and the flesh in skin, and the bones in flesh, and the heart in the breast, so are we, soul and body, clad in the goodness of God and enclosed, yea, and even more intimately, because all these others may waste and wear away, but the goodness of God is ever whole and nearer to us without any comparisons. For truly, our lover desires that our soul cleave to him with all its might, and that we evermore cleave to his goodness. For all things that the heart can think, this pleases God most and soonest succeeds. So we have a comment that no detail escapes his love. And I love in this vision the, the tactile images that we get. So what I'd like to do with as a, as a, as a group together is um, to um, invite us to close our eyes um, or to look at the sky or just 
let this vision come to you. And as I read it to you, see if you, how many visual details um, you might be able to bring to mind. Um, maybe even what pictures, what sensations, what emotions um, might come to you as you hear these words, okay? So this is a, this is a time to relax and hear, um, hear this, this vision and sort of vision along with, um, with Julian. Our good Lord showed to me a spiritual vision of God's simple loving. I saw that God is to us everything that is good and comfortable for us. God is our clothing, which for love enwraps us, holds us, and all encloses us because of God's tender love, so that God may never leave us. And so in this showing, I saw that God is to us everything that is good as I understood it. For God does not despise what God has created, and God does not disdain to serve us, even at the simplest duty that is proper to our body and nature because of the love of our soul, which God has made in God's own likeness. For as the body is clad in clothes and the flesh in skin and the bones in flesh and the heart in the breast, so are we, soul and body, clad in the goodness of God and enclosed, yea, and even more intimately, because all these others may waste and wear away, but the goodness of God is even whole and nearer to us without any comparisons. For truly, our lover desires that our soul cleave to him with all its might, that we evermore cleave to his goodness. For all things that the heart can think, this pleases God most and soonest succeeds. We have a comment that I love that the heart can think. Notice in that last line, and Amy says that she, she loves that it's non-cognitive. What else is coming up for you in this vision? I love the coziness of it. There's a deep sense of peace mm. and assurance of God's love and just wrapping around us. Mm. And it doesn't matter what we do, God just loves us for our being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are comments that I don't hear any sign of a wrathful God and the love that we are enclosed in the goodness of God, regardless of what we may be feeling, that God is love. Yeah. Let's continue. And she says, it is in her, in another account, it is necessary for us to have awareness of the littleness of created things and to disregard everything that is created in order to love and to have God who is uncreated. And for this, and this, and for this is the reason why we are not fully at ease in heart and soul, because here we seek rest in these things that are so little, in which there is no rest. And we do not recognize our God, who is all powerful, all wise, all good, for God is true rest. God wishes to be known, and God delights that we remain in God because all that is less than God is not enough for us. And this is the reason why no soul is at rest until it is emptied of everything that is created. When the soul is willingly emptied for love in order to have God who is all, then it is able to receive spiritual rest. Also, our Lord God showed that it is fully great pleasure to him that a pitiable soul come to him nakedly and plainly and simply saying, God of thy goodness, give me thyself for thou art enough for me. 
and I ask nothing that is less than can be full honor to thee. And if I ask anything that is less, ever that I be in want, for only in thee have I all. These words are fully lovely to the soul and most nearly touch the will of God and God's goodness. What do you find in this particular passage? Um, is there any idea here that you find intriguing or something that you would like to think more about? In some ways, this seems to go against the first passage we read where the little hazelnut and all of creation is is ennobled because it's a creature of God. And now she says we need to turn away from the creation. Mm -hmm. So I see a bit of a tension there. Right. Right. More thoughts on that? Or how might you respond? Yeah, what is she telling us about, about creation and about God? I, um, yeah, I find this so interesting. I, I don't, I didn't quite catch who added that last comment, but, um, yeah, I definitely recognize and was thinking about tension when we were reading these passages, but I, I think it's so interesting to think about creation is something that we recognize that God is incarnate in and cares deeply about. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's really interesting because I think about this, this most recent passage we read. Um, I just think about how there's a difference between recognizing that the goodness of something and then, but also realizing that that's not what we're meant to worship or mm -hmm. be, you know, that like those things are good because God is in them. And, you know, using these things of creation to ultimately draw us always back to the fact that the goodness in them comes from the Lord, mm. not from that thing because it's from God. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. We have the comment that I feel a calling from these words to turn from trying to find rest in material things which I feel like I've been doing, including social media, news cycles, and especially Netflix. <laughs> the material rest leaves me feeling empty. Yeah, I resonate with that. Yeah, it's a really interesting addition, I think, to that first passage and the sufficiency of, of creation, uh, or the insufficiency of creation and the su sufficiency of God, I guess. She says at the end that that God takes pleasure in these, these words. God of thy goodness, give me thyself, for you are enough for me. And I ask nothing that is less than can be full honor to thee. If I ask anything that is less, ever shall I be in want, for only in thee have I all. Um, we have a comment that someone appreciates that Julian says, God wishes to be known. God wishes to be known, and he delights that we remain in him. That's really incredible. Any other thoughts about what we've read so far before we carry on? Any questions that you're having, having at this point or any revelations of your own? <laughs> Amy? I just feel that that last line that you just read, um, if I ask for anything that is less, ever shall I be in want, for mm -hmm. only in thee I have all, like, that is, that must have been very hard one for Julian, for someone who they think she might have had a child that she lost in the plague, and she herself got very, very sick, and like you said, she went through these cycles of plagues, like, I just wonder, like, what is in her background life experiences that is say, letting her say that, right, like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Which he went through to be, to then come to that place to say, I know for a fact 
that if I ask for anything else, it might not happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. That is so, that's so intriguing. Yeah. I think to return to these life stories behind these words are always so, um, it's so powerful. But yeah, she certainly learned how to let go. Uh, these things were constantly ripped from her, from her life. Well, um, Julian, there's an interesting, um, some interesting passages on sin. Um, one of the comments from Mary Dryden was that in, in the first passage, we don't hear anything about a wrathful God. And um, that is such an interesting comment because sin does come up um, in her revelations and wrath and fear and suffering and blood and, and all kinds of violence. Um, so let's do some reading around this topic. She says, sin is the sharpest scourge that can strike anyone's spirit. This scourge wears down both man and woman, making them loathsome in their own sight. It is not long until they consider themselves suited only for hell, until the Holy Spirit's touch moves them to contrition and turns bitterness into hope in God's mercy. Then the spirit begins to heal the wounds, revive the spirit, and return the person to life. Dearly does our Lord protect us in his loving care when we seem to be almost forsaken and cast away on account of our sin. And indeed, we deserve as much. Yet, because of the humility that we acquire in this fashion, we are raised high in God's sight through God's grace. Contrition makes us clean. Compassion renders us ready. And desire for God makes us worthy. So all shame is transformed into joy and glory. For our courteous Lord does not wish his creatures to lose hope, even if they fall frequently and grievously. Our failure does not prevent God from loving us. Peace and love are always present within us, living and laboring. But we unfortunately do not always abide in peace and love. Were there any words or phrases that you heard in this passage that you could just speak out or add in? Return the person to life. And paraphrases are welcome. Compassion renders us ready. Contrition makes us clean. Mm. A desire for God makes us worthy. <laughs> Our courteous Lord does not, with his, does not want his creatures to lose hope. Don't lose hope when you fall and fail. Wish not, yeah. Shame is transformed into joy and glory. How is it, do you think, that shame is transformed? I wondered about that, too. What is, what's going on? What's the dynamic in which shame can be transformed into joy and glory? How could that happen? The Holy Spirit's touch. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, she says the Holy Spirit's touch moves them to contrition and turns bitterness into hope in God's mercy. Yeah. Making ourselves empty until God can fill us to the volume of our emptiness. Mm. 
Is there anything else that is coming up for you that you'd like to talk about in this, in this passage? Anything you notice? Well, let's continue. Um, in this next passage, I, um, oh, we have a comment before we move on, move on that my shame was instantly wiped away by God's love, instantly. And peace and love are always present, important for these cynical times. Yes. Shame is close to contrition in function. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yes, she says, peace and love are always present with us, living and laboring. But we, unfortunately, do not always abide in peace and love. There's a comment that I appreciate how she articulates the process of self-loathing to return to life. Yeah, she really is expressing these dynamics and sort of movements of the soul. Well, the next passage I love because she asks a question. It's almost like in the vision she's got, she's seeing Jesus on the cross and she has this opportunity <laughs> to ask all the questions she's ever wanted to ask of God. And I know we all have many of those if we had the opportunity. And of course we do in prayer, but like she's got him, you know, in, in, her, in her vision there. And she asks a question. She asks this amazing question, which is, okay, there's this sin, the sharpest scourge, that can strike anyone's spirit. And she asked God, like, why, why would you have allowed the sin? Like, you could have prevented it if you're God. Um, why would you prevent sin? Uh, why would you not prevent sin? And I think I love that because she's got this, um, I don't know, the courage uh, to ask, maybe the security in, in, in the love of God to ask um, a really hard question. So let's, let's, um, Let's see what happens here. She says, after that, the Lord brought to my mind the yearning that I had had for God in the past. And I saw that nothing stood in my way except sin. And thus I observed universally in us all. And it seemed to me that if sin had not been, we would all have been pure and like to our Lord as he made us. And thus, in my folly, before this time, I often wondered why, by the great foreseeing wisdom of God, that the beginning of sin was not prevented. For then it seemed to me all would have been well. I ought much to have given up this disturbing wondering, but nevertheless, I made mourning and sorrow about it without reason or discretion. But Jesus answered by this word and said, Sin is inevitable, but all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. In this unadorned word, sin, our Lord brought to my mind generally all that is not good and the shameful despising and the utmost tribulation he bore for us in this life and his dying. And with the beholding of this, with all pains that ever were or ever shall be, I understood that the passion of Christ to represent the greatest pain and ever more than that and all this pain was shown in one stroke and quickly passed over into comfort. We notice that this is the first uh, naming of Jesus in this reading. I would say too that um, I'm using a collection of different writings and different interpretations, different translations. Um, but that is interesting, isn't it? She often says our Lord, our courteous Lord. She has all sorts of um, names for God, names for Christ. So I'd like to pause for a minute. She talks about all the pain, the greatest pain, and ever more than that. Um, what is a pain as you think of this moment, 
um, in the world, in your life, in your experience, what is one pain that comes to your mind right now? Just a particular. Oh, I'm gonna mute myself so people don't confuse my with writing the questions. This may be a little bit of a comp. Well, I have been thinking a lot recently about the pain that comes with self protection, just in a lot of different arenas of life in the world, and what we've been dealing with on the news cycle in the past couple of months. So, what does that t say more about what self protection is for you? Um, I think self-protection in the sense of like the pain that comes in our neighborhoods and communities when we care more about protection of our body rather than like the body of Christ, or I've been thinking a lot about how I'm very prone to self-protection of my ego, even when that comes at the expense of other people and their lived experiences. And I'm yeah, and the pain that, that causes internally, but also for my neighbor. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Amy says, in Minneapolis, it is definitely police brutality and how that has uncovered the deep racism in a state like Minnesota that has historically considered itself liberal and welcoming. She says, I understood that the passion of Christ to represent the greatest pain and ever, even more than that, all this pain was shown in one stroke. So I think she's saying, you know, every pain that you can think of, every pain that you see or every pain that you carry um, is represented or in that one stroke of Christ's death. But she says, it quickly passed into comfort. And this is where um, Julian hears back from God when she says, you know, why, you know, how can it be that there is this love of God that is, you know, wrapping us in, in the blanket and layers and layers of layers of acceptance and love and grace. And yet there is this sin in the world. You know, how can God on one hand be a God of, of complete love and no wrath and yet, um, there is this world of pain and sin. And God says, what is impossible for thee is possible for me. What is impossible for thee is impossible for me. And she's left with this paradox that I, you know, I, she sees the, the conflict, the contrast of a, a completely loving God of no wrath and the, the, the inevitability of sin and the reality of sin that she says is deserving of punishment. And she's just left holding these two um, impossibilities. Um, a writer, Father John Julian Norwich, who actually is the, wrote the introduction to this version, this paraclete, the version of divine love. He says this, God shall do a secret deed which we cannot know until it is done and all shall ultimately be well. We are cautioned by Julian several times not to quote, busy ourselves to try to find out what the great deed will be. I suspect that Julian's answer, answer to those queries would simply be that what the great deed will be is God's business and not ours. And that is more than enough for a person of faith to know. For Julian, the knowledge of what God wills will finally come about is comfort enough. For Julian, the knowledge that what God wills will finally come about is comfort enough. So while we ponder this theological puzzle, Julian gives us some 
kind of pastoral advice. And I, again, I love the image of her standing at her window, counseling all of us as we come up with our pains and our concerns. And we have a comment here. Let's pause and see. Um, people like Julian pose a problem for me. So much attention on personal piety and personal sin. It seems to me we need new ideas of the spiritual life based on science. Since we now know that God created all as incomplete, all as in the process of development. In short, God did not create as the biblical image of the potter making completely finished products. We are in process. We are creatures who must learn. I like authors who focus their spiritual reflections on creatures constantly learning and God's service of shalom. Yeah, this adds a lot to our conversation. And I think um, my first thought is that that's, that's the beauty of these centuries of, of brothers and sisters who um, see the spiritual life from their one location. You know, for Julian, it's, it's this one little enclosed space in, a, in, in, in Norwich, can, surrounded by, by pain and suffering and very real existential fear. Um, and then here we have another person who's, who brings an understanding of science. And of course, so much that we've learned across time about the nature of physical material reality. Um, and so we can sort of, I think, follow these different people in different ways and um, learn from their, um, learn from their spiritual outlook. I don't know, what else, what else do you all think about that comment or what you might wanna add? Feel free to speak out or chat in. And of course, these vintage saints, as we call them, are human. You know, we can disagree. She could be totally wrong. We, we, could, we could all be wrong. We, we all speak out of our culture, and, and we all have limitations in what we can envisage. So obviously, Julian is not going to talk about modern science, right? That's not an option. Mm. But I think she does see a world in process. She, she does see that all eventually shall be well. I mean, that's saying that things are going to change. And so uh, I think she has a remarkable vision given the limitations that she had to work with. Mm. And Douglas, we were talking before this session that you study pietism and sort of mysticism. So um, I think it's beautiful that you're here to speak into this question. I just wanted to chip in a little bit. Um, I came a little bit late, so I don't know if you read the part about the hazelnut that she, she said, but I, I see that as very scientific in its own way, like in terms of all of the cosmos is, is, in, that, is in that hazelnut. Because um, the way that I, that I approach it, I guess myself, is that you know, all, all of creation is connected. And even from the Big Bang or before the Big Bang, mm -hmm. if they think that it all came from like some little dot the size of a period or something, we mm -hmm. are all connected. You know, it all burst into being from this oneness that started or, and we, we are all burst into being, so we can't be separated from each other really. And so the hazelnut to me is just a representation of that. Like it's all right here. It's all in your hand. It's all in you. It's all in the whole universe. Mm. So I don't see it as so personal. Uh huh. Thank you, Fran. Yeah, interesting that she might have this insight into, you know, this sort of cosmic truth and yet she sees it as a hazelnut because that's got, that's the image that she has at hand. Yeah. Other things coming up? Well, let's, let's see what else she has to say to us. Amy says, I appreciate Fran's comment. I agree with her about the hazelnut and the Big Bang. <laughs> I love that we have some sort of scientific of people. I was a philosophy major, so I'm like, I don't even know what that's about, but <laughs> beautiful. 
The constant seeking of the soul pleases God very much. The constant seeking of the soul pleases God very much. What does that mean to you? Uh, it seems to me that she's not big on guilt. <laughs> she, she's saying, you know, we sin, but all shall be well. And uh, you know you're incomplete, but at least you're seeking. Mm. So I think this is really healthy stuff. It's, it's the opposite of dwelling on guilt. Mm. Yeah, what would, what would life be like for us or our interior lives if, if we really truly believed with her? that the constant seeking of the soul pleases God very much. We wouldn't get into depression. <clears throat> we wouldn't get into um, feeling unforgiveness. We would constantly look forward to growing and working with God as we grow, which is what really life is about. Thank you. And as a pastor, Liz, you, you preach that every day. So I'm so grateful for your ministry. Yeah. I also, I'm, I was an architecture major, so I did not take any religious studies classes at UVA. So what I'm saying is really just coming from my own reading. It could be totally wrong. But when I was reading this, I was thinking of um, this, this line. I was... And I really love John's comment. Um, and it kind of made me think of some passages I had been reading recently of Kierkegaard. And I could be pronouncing his name totally wrong, but kind of this pursuit of, yeah, I was reading this argument. It was a lot about the pursuit of virtue being like the ultimate pursuit rather than virtues themselves. And I see a lot of this in what we're saying, like what, Julian saying here, and I think that that kind of aligns a lot with John's comment that I thought was so interesting is this idea of to pursue the soul, seek the soul implies to some degree that we can't fully recognize or understand the ways that God is incarnate in us mm -hmm. and what that soul really even is, but it's that kind of realization and dedication to the pursuit of almost like knowing without an end you know that is that there's a lot of value in um which I also think again just as a student's perspective I was just thinking about this I just graduated from UVA and completing a thesis again completely different from any um kind of course of theological study but this idea that I actually find that to be quite scientific in this idea that we're, we're kind of pursuing a question that hopefully leads to more questions, right? The, the goal is not to answer the question, it's to, to figure out what the deeper layers are that we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and that I don't, there's just amazing process she's kind of tapping into even from this small little cell. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think um, we have a comment that it reminds me of a growth mindset versus a, a fixed mindset as a psychological perspective. Yeah. Let's continue. She says, God is being and wants us to sit, dwell, and ground ourselves in the knowledge of God while at the same time realizing that we are noble, excellent, assessed as precious and valuable, and have been given creation for our enjoyment because we are loved. God is being and wants us to sit, dwell, and ground ourselves in the knowledge of God, while at the same time realizing that we are noble, excellent, assessed as precious and valuable and have been given creation for our enjoyment because we are loved. Again, I'm having this vision of like her surrounded by the plague, you know, half the people have died, their bodies. I mean, 
what was a person worth um, in that time. And yet she can say this, that we are noble, excellent, assessed as precious and valuable. Do you have any thoughts about this or words that you would like to call out? Again, this is in tension with number three, where we're to disregard all creation. Hmm. So how do you, what do you do with the tension? Or do you just sit with it since it's all about paradox? <laughs> well, I guess there's a kind of line, as somebody said earlier, we don't worship the creation. So there's a, we enjoy it, but we enjoy it for its creator as a gift. And somehow we can cross a line that it becomes a barrier to our relationship with God. And she's aware of that line, I guess. Mm. Thank you. Well, the, the following passage, I think, kind of follows this theme. And she writes, Our Lord desires that our spirit be truly turned to gaze upon God and upon all his glorious creation. For it is exceedingly good, and his judgments are sweet and comforting, and bring our soul to rest. For God has made all things, so all that's done is in some ways God's doing. No one acts but God. God never changes God's mind in anything and never will. Nothing in creation was unknown by God from the beginning. All was set in order before anything was made. Nothing will fail in its design, for all is abundantly good. So the Trinity is entirely pleased with its works. Behold, I am God. Behold, I am in all things. Behold, I accomplish all things. Behold, I never withdraw my arms from my work. Behold, I never fail to guide all things toward the purpose for which I created them before time began, with the strength, wisdom, and love with which I created all. So how can anything go wrong? <laughs> this is remarkable, being in the midst of the plague. Yeah. Yeah, how can you talk about that as a blessing from God? Um, and it's all toward a purpose for which God created before time began. That mm -hmm. really takes a, a giant leap of faith. Yeah. And uh, it almost seems not admitting the, the pain and suffering and the uh, randomness and it's denial of randomness, mm. saying that everything is under God's will, and even the evil of sickness is under God's will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for cl really clarifying some of these pro some of the the complexities of this and the struggle of this. What do you all think? I go back to her saying, you know, God is being, you know, God is, it's like a, a verb of uh, God is a verb um, being. And it, it makes me think of Jesus saying, I am the way, like a, like the process almost. Um, and so if, if, if it's, if there's something significant about the process or the way or the being then wherever you find yourself in being, whatever the being consists for you, whatever your life is, you know, that's where you're going to find God or you're going to miss God. Right. Um, and so you can choose to try, like, like she said before, like I always, I thought of what, whatever the quote was before is that, you know, seeking your soul or whatever it's trying you try you put the effort in and you you seek you and and you see where you can find it in in the context of the life in which you find yourself no matter whether that life is 
you know, <clears throat> sick or in the midst of plague or a depression or whatever it is. Mm. The constant seeking of the soul pleases God very much. Yeah. yeah but I think it's probably good for us too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We say, be still and know that I am God. This reminds me of, reminds me of St. Augustine. No one acts but God. You've got this, you know, everything comes out as God wants it to come out. It's, it sounds very Augustinian. Hmm. It sounds also very Hebrew. Yahweh, I am who I am. Mm -hmm. And God is all things. So even the plague works toward a purpose for which God has created before time again. And so even in the worst things, we can see God working a purpose. All things work for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Again, as a non-theologian student, this made me think of pop culture reference. I don't know if anybody's seen this interview that kind of went viral between um, Stephen Colbert and um, Anderson Cooper after Anderson Cooper's mother died and Stephen Colbert, who's in mental pain in his life, said, what punishments of God are not gifts? And I remember seeing that on like a YouTube video and I was like, mm. and it feels very Julian to me. Um, so. Put that quote in the chat box, would you? Yeah. We have a comment that um, be still and know that I am God versus busy yourself. And I am always struck by how intense pain clarifies and sharpens and deepens the faith of the most faithful among us. Mm. Mm. Yeah, she's definitely speaking from a, pl a position of authority on pain. So this is no, you know, happy go lucky. Oh, all will be well. Like, don't worry, be happy. I think it's very pragmatic, or at least that's the way I think of it, is like, t to me, it's like, okay, well, maybe your life sucks. Maybe you find yourself in the worst situation possible. But if you don't find God there, you ain't going to find God at all. There's no other place mm. that you're going to find, except for in the context of your own life and your own times and, and the way it is. And, and, you know, creation is a really long event, I think, you know, the unfolding of creation. It's not like humans have even been around for you know very long at all like the whole thing is unfolding so we think it all has to improve and get to the end of of you know ultimate goodness in our lifetime mm -hmm. and i think that's just a faulty very small like because we are small and our time is small concept but i just don't think that that's how it really ultimately is mm. <laughs> yeah she would certainly agree with you there, I think. Yeah. Well, in our time, the last few minutes we have together, um, again, like, how are you receiving Julian right now in this moment? Is there, do you have any words that you'd like to put to this or um, any, or even any feelings or any description of, of what you're hearing from her and what you'd like to hold on to um, as you continue through your life today or? in these days? I receive it as a comfort and a gift. Mm. Thank you. I receive it as a challenge to look for God in everything, mm. absolutely everything, from the rain to our pain, to depression, to the pandemic, to the racial conflict, to the protests, to the deaths, by police, to the police brutality. Look for God there. Thank you, Liz. And we have a comment. I receive this as a reminder that pain is not exclusive to this moment. Well, as we go, this is our blessing, and I hope to see you next week for C.S. Lewis for something entirely different. <laughs> May the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again to our doors. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen.
Go in peace. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, I'm a philosophy. Bill. I'm a Wheaton philosophy major too. Ah, right on.